elementary music teacher friend, you love what you do, but you might feel unappreciated and in fact, unseen some days. You may even feel like you're on a music teacher island and just want to connect with other music teachers who can relate to both your struggles and wins when it comes to teaching elementary music. I get you and understand completely the feelings you're having. That's why each and every week, the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast will provide you with solo and guest episodes that will help you realize you're not alone in your music teaching journey. Throughout each episode, my goal is for you to be able to walk away with actionable steps and ideas to help you feel like you're ready to take on the new week with whatever challenges may be thrown your way. Hi, I'm your host, Jessica Peresta, and I'm so glad you're here. Whether you're at home, in your car, in the shower, or wherever else you're listening, grab your cup of coffee or whatever other beverage is nearby and listen in to the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. Hey friend, I want to let you know about a free workshop that I am so excited about called How to Design Curriculum for Your Elementary Music Classroom, Five Easy Ways to Simplify Lesson Planning. This free workshop will happen live at various dates and times throughout the year. So sign up so you'll be notified when the workshop is and you can go to subscribepage.com forward slash curriculum design workshop, or simply click on the link in the show notes. In this workshop, we'll go over starting with the end in mind, knowing your desired results for yourself and students, planning assessment before mapping out the lessons, and having a system in place. When you come to this workshop, I'm going to show you how you can make the ultimate shift from struggling with weekly lesson planning feeling overwhelmed and exhausted knowing how to plan relevant lessons to knowing how and what to plan each week by adding systems and a proven framework to your planning. So to sign up, once again, the link is subscribepage.com forward slash curriculum design workshop. And I can't wait to see you there. I'm Chris Dutchko, co-host of the Ninth Grade Experience Podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm joined by my guest, Emmy Ferguson, and we're going to be talking about inspiring the next generation of composers. So this is going to be an amazing conversation. And teachers, I know you're going to get so much relevant information you can bring back to your students. So with that said, Emmy, welcome to the podcast. I would love for you to introduce yourself. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I am uh, trained as a flute player. I sing, I compose. Um, I just wrote a book about composers. So, um, and I guess I'm an omnivorous musician in every way. I love that. That's a great description. (laughs) I feel like as musicians, a lot of us are. And I remember even going through college, I started as a piano performance major and then switched to music education. And I think that's because... When you're in college, you're like, I don't know, I just want to be a musician or or practice music in whatever way. And I didn't know exactly where my journey would take me. Nobody does. And so even the getting the degree part, but I thought, well, I can still be an accompanist. I can still teach private lessons. I could teach in school. I could, I could, I could. And it's hard sometimes because you feel like you have to narrow it down to one thing. But like you just said, you don't have to. So that's great conversation all on its own. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's really important for all of us to remember that sort of specializing as a musician is a very, very um, contemporary and modern construct. Um, when we look at someone like J.S. Bach, you know, he he would have never imagined specializing in one thing. He was a teacher. He was um, a, a church musician. He was a performer, not only of like sacred works, secular works, but also like folk music. He loved to improvise. Um, and at that time, you know, it was, you couldn't just be a performer. You almost always composed as well. And so many of these people were also lawyers, which is, mm-hmm. seems like a very funny thing to add into the right? mix. <laughs> but just to say that like there was there was no one right way to do music. And, um, you know, we should continue to encourage people to explore 
all of the different avenues that um, give them curiosity within the musical world and beyond. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I didn't know that. That's something new to me yeah. is that a lot of them were lawyers. But while you're saying it's that, it's always like they went yeah, to law school. So I never get that. But, but it kind of yeah. makes sense. I mean, the brain, the musician brain, I could see breaking it down, in a, you know, like being a lawyer, being good at that. <laughs> it's organization and the, arguing. I don't know. Not like we argue, but you know what I mean? I could just see it. Yeah. I can see it happening, like both worlds fitting together. Um, and also something you said about just the composers in general, giving the example of J.S. Bach, I think so many times, even I know even me taking a music history class in college, you know, I learned about a lot of the composers and being a classically trained pianist, but not as in depth as I would have liked to. It was just kind of like a story on a page, but it wasn't so much of really understanding their life. And they were real human beings with, yeah. like you said, multiple passions and that's what makes their music, I, in my opinion, so incredible. You see a billion notes on a page and you're like, what in the world? But they were doing all these other things too, which is incredibly, I don't know, awesome. <laughs> so I love that you said yeah. that. And learning about all those things just makes you appreciate their music more and makes you able to see things within it that, um, you know, you might, you might have overlooked if you just had one vision of who this person is. And today, you know, we are so used to um, the idea of presenting one side of yourself on the internet, perhaps like social media often mm -hmm. portrays a certain vision of a, of who a person is, but it's not the full person. And the same thing is true when we look back in history, we are so often just seeing one side of this three-dimensional figure. And so it's up to us to sort of dig deeper and find out all of those things that made them, you know, live, love, learn all everything. Yeah, that's awesome. So speaking of composers, we're going to relate this conversation back to teachers and in order for them to help their students get to know composers and also how they could possibly be a composer themselves. So we're going to talk about, like I said in the intro, is inspiring the next generation of composers. So when talking to teachers about this, how, what advice, I guess, is what I want to say, do you have for teachers around the inspiring part of this? Well, I think that inside all of us, especially when we're younger, we love exploring sounds. It's one of the sort of most exciting things, whether it's listening to nature with animals or just hitting things together. One of the first things that kids do, right, is they, they make sound mm -hmm. by, by putting two different objects together. And it's, you know, part of identifying what that object is as well and sort of embracing that that in itself is composition. It is yeah. music making. All composing is, is exploring sound in whatever way it inspires you at that point in time. And that can change and it can evolve. Um, and you can call it by different names, but it's composing. Mm. I love how you broke that down because a lot of times we view composing as the notes. I've already mentioned this on a page on which is the composer put those notes there or someone helped them do it. But composing starts with improvisation, even like as a baby, they don't know they're creating music. They just are. It's just ingrained in them. And I mean, I see the joy on my students faces now at my brand new school. I teach the littles all the way through fourth grade and those little bitties. I don't have to give them an egg shaker and tell them how to do it. They immediately have it. Some put them in their mouth, but most of the time <laughs> they're holding it and they just start shaking it. And I see some putting it by their ear, shaking it, or they're looking at the instrument while they're shaking it or they're turning it sideways. And I remember the other day, it was like an aha moment for me going, oh my gosh, like every one of them is kind of playing it in their own way. And it was just, it made me smile because I thought this is so cool. I didn't give them any instructions on the way to play it. They just all started shaking it in their own way. So that is, like you said, the fundamentals and foundations of composing, we probably just have, haven't really thought about that. Yeah. And, and again, that is a, a very recent construct. You know, we only have written music, um, you know, we have some examples of of, mm -hmm. of ancient Greece, but they're very hard to decipher and, and ancient Babylonian. But um, mostly we have in the past 1000 years, but 
human civilization has been much, much older than that. And there has been music throughout all of it. We know this because we've found instruments that are 50,000 years old wow. and more. And so people have been making music. It's been part of our cultural DNA and identity. Um, I think since we started, you know, banding together. Um, and so it would be, I think, a real shame not to call those mm, all of our ancestors, mm -hmm. composers, just because we don't have um, anything remaining right. on in a written format of their music, but we have it inside of ourselves, and it's sort of baked into us from just being being human. Ooh, when you just said something, it sparked a question. When you were saying our ancestors had composed music and it'd be so cool if we could have recorded that but oh we gosh. know but you said it's inside of us so when we're having the conversation around teachers inspiring their students that is a way to inspire them is yeah. you know a lot of these kids i don't know a lot but like i i know i had to do a project like this but do a family tree project for example and who are your who are your great grandparents great 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 grandparents and then kind of doing research well in the process of that it may be an aha moment where, oh my gosh, they, they were a musician. I had no idea or something like that. So when inspiring students to be composers, do you think that's a great way to do that as well? It's to kind of know their family history and origins of who were musicians or slash composers in their families as well? I think that's one way you can do it, but there's so many of us who, who don't have access to information about our families. And so it's just reminding everyone that it doesn't matter where you came from. You have mm -hmm. music in your, you know, in your in your cells, in your bones. Um, we have it just the think about your heartbeat, right? That in itself is music. You've been hearing not only your own heartbeat, but your mother's heartbeat since you were in the womb. And so you've had this, the song, like the heartbeat song. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine talked about this recently and I loved it. Um, his name is uh, Dr. Bridge Hill Kennedy, and he's a developmental psychologist. And we were playing a concert together and, and he was talking about how like that song was with us from for nine months and we all shared that same song. And so that rhythm and the flow of, of just the blood moving around our body, that is music. It's baked into us, whether we want it to be, or we don't want it to be. Mm -hmm. And we have it every day, just, you know, as we move around, even this, you know, like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's sound, it's beautiful. Yeah. Even a newborn baby, yeah. they will recognize a song maybe their mom had been singing to them when they were pregnant and then it's almost like this happened to me with one of my sons i sang this particular song and they stopped crying and i remember being like that's crazy <laughs> in a good way but i was like could, and then i that was my thought i was like could they remember that i sang that the whole time i was pregnant and maybe they just heard it like again yeah. on the outside and we're like oh my gosh i know this song so that's awesome yeah so whether you're you know your students are kind of doing research about composers in their family or slash musicians or just realizing that it's already ingrained in them i think it is so important just you know this whole conversation around inspiring students to know they already are composers whether they put a single note down on a staff paper or not they are and so i love how this conversation's already started going so you've mentioned you've written a book about composers in fact it is iconic composers and you explore 50 different composers and i would love to ask you where did the idea for this book come from uh, this idea came from the illustrator of the book, whose name is David Lee Sisko. And this is the third book in a series of four currently that explores um, iconic people in different industries. And he's somebody that I've known a long time through his cousin, Nicholas Sisko, who is the other co-author of this book. We wrote it together. And um, David has done a lot of incredible portraits of composers in the past. And he reached out to the two of us to ask if we might write some descriptions and biographies and, and pick 50 composers that we felt represented um, the little toe dipping into the giant ocean of, of composers. Mm -hmm. And these are 50 composers from the Western classical canon. So it's already a very, very narrow group of composers within like the whole wide world of different kinds of music makers. Um, and then within that, 
This is only 50 people. So it's a really small subsection, but we are really hopeful that it gives you um, just a glance into 50 very different lives, mm. 50 very different ways of making music. Mm -hmm. I went and took a peek at the book, which I'm going to order, but I took a peek at the book on your website and that was the first thing I noticed was the graphics. Yes, immediately <laughs> was like, oh my gosh, these are so cool because- They're really fun. Every picture I have found of Composer so far has been <laughs> just very, I don't know how to explain it, outdated looking, I guess. And so just having these pictures that kids would love to look at, first of all, it kind of draws them in. Yeah. To, it's They're fun. They're fun images. And then the the descriptions and about the composers, they're in an easy to understand language for children where it's not just an 1800, da, 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 was born. And, then he, <laughs> and so I, yeah, I just wanted to point that out because I wanted to do my research before our conversation. And I was like, this book is so cool because I haven't really found a composer book I've liked so far. So this is it. Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah. It's really important to us as we were writing them that um, it wasn't just a laundry list or a bio, like a, um, you know, a laundry list of mm -hmm. pieces they've written and they were in this city here and this one, but that it really tried to give snapshots of who they were as people and get you excited about that so that then you can go and explore their music and sort of imagine that their personality is really um, affecting the choices that mm. they're making. So bringing it back to a musical artist of today mm -hmm. or composer, we can talk about either one. I know a musical artist, a child really likes, I don't know, I've really, I've been seeing NSYNC tickets might be going on sale. So let's talk about Justin Timberlake, <laughs> so, fangirl. But anyways, um, it's really neat to read the stories of musical artists and to kind of be like, how did they start? Like, where did they just come from on the scene all of a sudden? Like, what was their journey like? And I know a lot of students just from conversations I've had with kids, they like to do that. They're like, did you know this person? Da, 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 da. And yeah. sometimes I'm like, no. So I think that's great because to them in this day and age we live in that is relevant to them. It's these people are alive at the same time as me, but for the composers that from you know 200 years ago or whatever it is that they don't personally know about like you said starting with the story of this person draws them in for them to go oh wait i kind of want to listen to this music now and it makes more sense to me of i can kind of hear their story in their music because i got to know that person through a book so would you say that's kind of I don't know, like those thoughts make sense. <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean, and when we look back, especially to composers who were living several hundred years ago, it can be really hard to sort of think about what that might have been like. Um, it's a very different time to when we're living where, you know, uh, there were huge sections of our society that were not given the you know, equal rights to mm -hmm. others. And so we are looking, you know, we're taking a look into the past that is a past that we we wouldn't be able to recognize ourselves and so empathizing with with those people can be challenging if you're not looking at them sort of um on a family level or mm -hmm. on an inspirational level because it's it's just a very different time sometimes they spoke different languages that, than we speak now um politics were very, very different. Religion was very different. Everyday life, you know, technology, el electricity, you know, all mm -hmm. of these things means that it can be, um, you know, kind of hard to sort of wrap our brains around what that might yeah. have been like without sort of feeling that empathy with them through, yeah. through the stories. Yeah. So I mentioned bringing it back to the kids today like they are really interested in different musical artists and before we even started recording i told you that i know a lot of students do just view the word composer as someone who lived long ago as i've heard a student say to me recently they lived long ago well a <laughs> lot of them did let's be honest a lot of them did yes but i don't think they realize that the field of composing is still a relevant career today. And so how do we help students better understand that, like you already mentioned, they're already composing, even kiddos are, but how do we help them realize that there are composers in our world that are alive today as well? Yeah, I think it's reminding ourselves that everything we hear on the radio, 
every song we hear, if you listen to the radio or Spotify or Apple Music, that was composed by someone. And in many cases, it's composed by multiple people, the songs that we hear on the radio mm-hmm. today. Every movie that you watch has music that was composed by somebody. Every even reality TV show has music that was composed by someone whose job it is to write the music for that. We are inundated by music today in a way that um, composers 300 years ago couldn't possibly comprehend because music was something that could only be uh, appreciated live. There were no recordings. Um, So the fact that we have so much access to it has also kind of made us take it for granted that all of this music is a result of, um, of somebody's work. Someone's creating it and being inspired to create that. Um, And there are many, many more ways to make uh, money making music today than perhaps in the past, because there's all these different other kinds of technology that use it. Even, you know, so much so as when uh, you use a car and it has different sounds for backing up or moving forward. Mm. That's a musical choice that somebody made um, to, you know, help us know when to stop and when to go. <laughs> yeah. But all of these things can um, be music. And I think it's encouraging kids to follow their curiosity um, as they're thinking about sound, remembering that that sound is music in and of itself. And when they put different combinations of sounds together, that is composing. And you can start with one, then you can do two, four, eight, 16, and you can grow it as, as, you know, as big as you want. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite things to do with students is to break it down for them in a way kind of like you just said is you hear the music everywhere you go the grocery store or a ball game or wherever commercials like you said tv shows movies but you just hear it sometimes you don't you know you're walking out of a movie when the credits are playing and there's amazing music sometimes i like to stick around just to hear the music at the end but Mm -hmm. kids are if they've never really been taught how to listen to that or to hey stop next time you're at let's say a baseball game and hear the music they're playing over the loudspeaker or sometimes there's a live organist or whatever it might be stop and listen to that because a lot of times it's just you know it's loud and there's things going on you don't really you kind of hear it as like background noise but it's really neat when i've kind of given an instruction for kids to do that in their world and say come back next week when you see me and tell me where did you hear music in your world? And they're like, oh my gosh, I was walking through the grocery Everywhere. store with my mom and there was music and I didn't even realize, I never really heard it before because I just was walking around the store. So mm-hmm. it's neat when you give them kind of, hey, stop, reflect, think about it. And then you're gonna be hearing music more in your world than you probably didn't even realize was there before. Of course, you know, just walking outside and hearing bird song is in itself one of the things that as humans we wanted to imitate you know that's why so much of the music that we make exists now um is to imitate nature's song there's a beautiful article Mm. i think i read it this morning actually in the in the new york times about how mice sing songs wow (laughs) and we can't hear it because the frequency is too high for us to hear but how they have you know almost individual songs too and it's used as language and of course reminding everybody that the fact that we are able to communicate through speech through language is in itself a form of composition a form of music making and a form of communication which really is what music is you know it's deep down it's a way of expressing oneself and communicating Mm -hmm. with the world around you Mm -hmm. yeah that's great even telling kids to go listen to the music outside and you know you'll get that pushback they're like that's not music i'm like yeah it is and when we explain how they're they're singing pitches the birds they're listen to what notes they're singing and i i'll be in my backyard sometimes laying in my hammock and i remember one day (laughs) hearing different birds and you could just tell they were communicating but they were all singing different pitches one was singing the same tone over and over another one kept moving their pitches up and down up and down and then another one just would kind of rest a lot and then would come in with like a quarter note and of course like everybody's gonna not gonna nerd out as much as us musicians but i was just sitting there going oh my gosh they're repeating these same patterns and each of them have a different one but they're in a way all communicating with each other. And I, yeah. So laying there and just listening to that was so neat 
because like you said, like we get inspired even by animals making noises and making music. And so I love being able to tell kids that as well. Listen, when you're outside, what are the cars? There's horns, there's noises, there's from the engines revving, there's whatever else cars do, but just <laughs> music is all around us is what I'm getting at. Totally, totally. Yeah. So do you feel students will be able to identify themselves with various composers and in return, it would help them to create music as well, maybe by reading the pages of your book or by exploring other composers that are out there, being able to identify with someone will inspire them. Absolutely. I, I always think that, you know, that's a fantastic way to sort of feel invited into it. If, if it feels, you know, classical music um, historically has, has been placed out of arm's reach of a lot mm -hmm. of people. Um, and we're really working to try and break down all of those walls that we built up and encourage everybody to get involved and listen and to make that music. And so being able to see people that you can relate to um, is a fantastic way to feel that you are invited into the conversation and into the music making, um, not only in this genre, but in any genre. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Emmy, I've loved this conversation. Do you have any advice before we go, maybe anything we haven't talked about yet that you want to share with the listeners? Oh, just to follow your curiosity and to follow your students' curiosity. Um, music, the way that we are able to advance and, and to create new types of music is from people going down those wormholes of things that 99% of us thought wasn't music. Mm. And it's amazing to look back in time and see concert reviews of people like Beethoven um, that were, you know, horrified by the, as I think they call it noise that they were hearing. Like, this is not music. This is just noise. And today we can't even fathom that. Um, but it takes those innovators, those people who are willing to explore and, you know, push past what, um, you know, we might consider today to be, you know, quotation mark music mm -hmm. um, that are going to create music for us for the future. So encourage all of your students to follow even the things that feel like it's an outlier, like that's going to turn into something amazing. And, and just the fact that you're able to follow that path and follow that curiosity in and of itself is an uh, incredible um gift to your students. So don't, don't shut anything down in terms of sounds that they're making, because it could be, you know, the next incredible thing that we don't know about. Oh, so good. I'm sitting here nodding the whole time and just smiling <laughs> because I agree completely with everything you just said. So good. Where can everybody find out more about you, but also your book, Iconic Composers? You can find out more about me on my website, which is emmyferguson.com. And you can find out about um, my performances, the CDs I've made, there are videos of me performing, but there's also a lot of information about this book, um, Iconic Composers. Uh, there are some links there to order it on our our publisher's website, which is Trope Publishing, as well as on Amazon or Barnes and Nobles. Um, if you love it, you know, Go tell your local bookseller because mm. they're the people who are doing so much hard work for um, for getting books into people's hands these days. Um, and it's it's really fun. It's got a bright yellow cover and it's got an incredible illustration by David Lee Sisko on the front of Joseph Bologna, who's known as the Chevalier de Saint-Georges. Mm. Um, and uh, he's an incredible, incredible story composer, performer. Um, he did so many cool things. Um, and we just touch upon a few of them in the book. And um, yeah, I can't wait for you all to read it. Oh, I would love that. We will include those links in the show notes as well. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I've appreciated this conversation and know it is going to definitely impact a lot of teachers and their students. Well, thank you. And thank you to all of those teachers who are doing the incredibly hard and important work of, of training the next generation of musicians. Without you, none of us would be doing what we do. So thank you. 
Well, hey there. Thank you so much for listening into the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. There is an exclusive Facebook group just for listeners of this podcast and any elementary music teacher called the Elementary Music Teacher Community Facebook group. Come on over and join us there where we have conversations around the podcast episodes and encourage each other each and every week. And also head to my website, thedomesticmusician.com. I have some free resources there that you can download to help you gain traction in your classroom today as well as the blog and the membership site and all kinds of other goodies to help you keep going in your music teaching journey. I cannot wait to keep connecting with you and encouraging you and spurring you on in your journey of teaching elementary music. Hang in there, have an amazing week, and I will see you soon.